it's a delight to have you all here and to welcome Eric Karpolis back to the New School. Eric, um, before I say a little about your biography, I want to mention that um, you have been a Commonwealth board member um, and one of our hosts at the New School with uh, Steve Heilig and uh, Erwin Keller and uh, Susan Braun and John Evans and others. Um, but your uh, work with the New School is quite extraordinary. I just want to go over some of the things that Eric has done here. He held conversations with uh, W.S. Merwin, Jane Hirschfield, and Robert Haas. He offered a tribute to Elizabeth Bishop. He led community readings of Walt Whitman and Thoreau that were deeply cherished by those participating. He talked with conductor Michael Tilson Thomas. He explored reading Shakespeare and Tolstoy with Hanford Woods. He spoke with filmmakers Francis McDormand and Joel Cohen and with Anna DeVere Smith. And you did a series of conversations with me on your remarkable books on art in Proust and on the quest for the Polish painter Józef Czapski. So I'm sure I'm missing quite a lot on that <laughs> list, but that gives you a sense of Really, if you go to the New School uh, website and just type Carpellas into the uh, search bar, and you'll find, I think it's 17 different events that Eric has done. So we just owe you a, a debt of gratitude for that. Well, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> it was... Um, <clears throat> It all came out of it, the possibility of doing something that Commonweal offers and the new school, the idea of bringing people together to talk about ideas. And, uh, and I had the freedom to choose what I wanted to. I had the luxury of, of connection with some people who are very interesting working artists and uh, thinkers. And um, it, uh, it felt very natural. So we are here uh, to talk again about your work on uh, Josef Chopsky and your new um, book on him called An Apprenticeship of Looking. And it's a large format art book. And the, the context is uh, that you um, uh, previously translated a series of Chopsky's essay, uh, uh, lectures in a Soviet prison camp uh, called Lost Time. And then you did this extraordinary, I think, definitive uh, critical biography called Almost Nothing. And now this third book is uh, the art book, An Apprenticeship of Looking, an artist's monograph. Um, you also... Um, are the translator of Proust's Overcoat from the Italian. Um, and uh, you did this wonderful book in 2008 called Paintings in Proust, uh, which was widely translated. A few more biographical notes. Um, you are a fellow of the... Czeslaw Miłosz. Thank you. Czeslaw Miłosz Institute at Claremont Colleges. You've given the Amon Carter Lecture on the Arts at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin. You've worked as a volunteer ambulance driver, spoken on Proust at Berkeley in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, walked from Bath to Oxford, appeared as a runway model during a fashion week in Paris and Florence, interviewed composer and lyricist Stephen Sondheim on stage, and collaborated on a book of mathematical equations and Hebrew references used as a prop in the film by the Cohen brothers. <laughs> so that just gives you a sense of the, uh, the breadth of reference here. You studied- Like Thomas Jefferson having dinner alone at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> you studied at the Art Students League in New York as a boy and were awarded a residency at the Cité des Arts in Paris as a young man. A voracious reader whose idea of hell is being on public transportation without a book. <laughs> you like to cook, or more tellingly, you like to eat. You once had tea with Indira Gandhi, uh, 
and you lived with the same man for 40 years. So that's uh, just a, a sense of context about Eric. And I, I didn't pick these at random. He actually put these facts on various websites. So I can't be <laughs> critiqued for that. So um, for those who haven't heard um, previously about your work on Chopsky, let's just start with the uh, original question. Uh, who was Josef Chopsky? Josef uh, Chopsky was a painter, which was my primary interest in him. He was also a writer and a public figure in the second half of the 20th century. He uh, was a Polish-born aristocrat, came from a family with uh, lands in what is now Belarus. Um, he went to Petersburg, St. Petersburg, as a nine-year-old boy to begin his training for um, the baccalaureate. Uh, it was very common, it continues to be common, I understand, with a lot of the aristocracy to send children away to, uh, to um, boarding school. Uh, he was, um, at that age, early in his life, he wanted to be a musician. He played the piano four hours a day in addition to all of his studies. Um, he was in Russia from 1909 until 1917. So that meant that he was in St. Petersburg when the February and October revolutions happened in Russia. He had family in Russia. His aristocratic background meant that his family stock came from wide, a wide swath of Europe. There were Finnish, there were Austrian, there were um, uh, Polish, uh, German, uh, Russian ancestors. So he was very much a cosmopolitan. At home in Poland, uh, they spoke German. His mother was Austrian. Um, his father was Polish, was a Polish count. But his father didn't learn to speak Polish until he was in university, until he was 15. That's an example of the kind of way in which that level of, uh, of life um, was lived, that there were, um, there were German tutors, there were you know, French, uh, music teachers, there were uh, Italian fencing masters, all of that kind of thing played into his early, very, very privileged life. When the revolution came, um, all of that ended because the Soviets occupied that part of Poland in which he had been living. And so he went from being a, he went from being a very pampered, very um, privileged young man to being a pauper. Um, so he wanted to defend his country, so he joined the Polish army in Russia uh, and very soon realized that he was a pacifist and that he could not kill another person. He was very much at that time under the influence of Tolstoy, uh, who was preaching pacifism and, and Christian will. Um, so he went to his commanding officer and essentially said, I can't do this. And he expected that he would be court-martialed and possibly shot, which was standard behavior for that kind of um, response. However, the, he was fortunate and his commanding officer said, yes, I was young once too. You know, um, if you want to try and change the world, go ahead. He released him. I think a large part of that might have had to do with his having been an aristocrat and um, the fear of the commanding officer of offending the powers that be. The Chapsky family was enormously well-connected throughout Europe in terms of uh, power and, um, and presence. Um, so he and his sister, one of his sisters, two of his sisters, started a shelter in Petersburg to help people who were struggling, who were um, uprooted and who were hungry. Uh, during the revolution, which was a time of enormous upheaval, uh, people in the streets, there was chaos. And very soon after, it became clear that they would not be able to survive. So they went back to Poland. Um, he joined the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw and studied for about six months. This is now 1919. Uh, in 1919, the Soviet Union 
victorious in this revolution and determined to spread communism to the rest of Europe, decided to invade Germany, which had been destroyed at the end of the First World War, where they felt there would be a breeding ground for the advance of communism. So they were going to send all of their troops to all of their forces to claim Germany as a communist state. But how do you get from Germany to Germany from Russia? You have to cross Poland. And the Poles, newly a republic, because at the end of the First World War, Poland ceased to be partitioned. Here I, I'm going on, I'm giving a history lecture, but you, um, it's all relevant to who Chapsky is. Um, at the end of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles determined that um, the Prussian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Tsarist Russian Empire would cease to exist. They were all defeated in the First World War. And so those three empires had occupied Poland since the middle of the 18th century. So in 1919, Poland for the first time in, many, in over 100 years became a republic, the Second Republic of Poland. So this is what Chapsky moved back from Russia to be part of this new blossoming republic. So he went to this academy and then in six months, the Soviets began to invade Russia to get to Germany, and the new Polish state stood up to Russia and, you know, and fought for their, the integrity of their sovereignty, which they had just newly won. Uh, it, was, um, it was very, very unlikely that the Poles would be able to hold off the Soviets, the Red Army, the enormous Red Army, which is uh, huge. And, but for certain reasons, um, at one point in a certain battle, uh, the Poles made, were able to divide two of the wings of the, Pol of the Red Army and actually broke them down and the Soviets fled in, in defeat. They went back to Russia. Essentially, Poland managed to defeat the Soviet Union um, in what's known as the, uh, the Battle of Warsaw. Uh, all of this to say that Chapsky had decided he wanted to defend this new republic, so he joined the army again this time as a, a, a private soldier instead of um, in the officer corps. And he, um, he was the recipient of the Virtuti Militari, which is the highest honor that Poland gives to a soldier for bravery. So that's 19, that war ends 1920, 1921, Chapsky goes back. He re-enrolls at uh, a different Academy of Fine Arts, this time um, in Krakow, uh, which is a city that he had never known before. He's a Pole who's never been to Krakow before. Um, and he studies with uh, a group of students in the Academy. And after about two years, he decides, this is not for me, in the sense that he's very engaged in becoming a painter, but the uh, the teaching that he's receiving and the, uh, the sensibility of the school is very much against his taste. He knows what's happening in painting. He had been to Paris, he'd been around, he knew that what was happening in Poland was very backwater. Mm -hmm. Everything was historical or religious in theme, and this is what this group of students, they were being trained to perpetuate this, um, this strain of Polish painting. Um, I, I have said before um, and have been chastised for it by Polish friends, but I still think it's true that there's very little warmth in Polish painting. That, you know, when you see Italian and French and even English, you see pictures with a lot of warmth. Uh, the human flesh is palpable. In Poles, everybody is covered in, in you know, capes and boots, and it, there's very little feeling for the flesh. And I think it's, it's the repressive quality of Catholicism that does that. So Chapsky didn't want that. So he and 12 friends decided, we're going to go to Paris. So they decided on a scheme by which they would raise money. They did different events. They sold paintings. They did all sorts of things to raise money so that these 12 painters could go to Paris for six weeks. They went to Paris for six weeks, and they stayed for seven years. Mm -hmm. 
They were so stimulated, they felt that this was where they wanted to be. Paris, of course, at the time, that we're now talking mid-1920s, 1924, 1925, 1926. Uh, these are the years when people from all over the world came to Paris to paint. It's the years when, for instance, the American population in Paris was great, Hemingway, a lot of people had just come. It was the center of the art world. And they were actually very poor, and, and like many other people, they, um, they made it work for them. So they stayed for seven years. In that time, everybody continued painting, everybody developed their, their strength as painters, and Chapsky struggled because he really didn't have his painting voice. He did manage um, to paint enough so that um, Gertrude Stein bought a painting of his in a, in a show. Um, and in those years in Paris, he, he got to know everybody in a way that is almost unthinkable now. Uh, because of his aristocratic connections. He knew people um, in the upper level of Paris society. And as a, a kind of, um, as a bohemian, he knew all the artists. So he had a very generous, generous time in Paris. He then went back to Poland. Um, in, after seven years, the group of 12 decided it was time to go back to Poland. Um, and that was 1931. And then he set up a studio, he began painting, and he brought French color and French impressionism and French modernity back to Poland with him and, and struggled and began to paint. And then in 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union invaded Poland, and we jumped to that period. So I will fast forward now. He's a prisoner of war. We get through the war. He never goes back to Poland. after, after When he leaves as a prisoner of war, in 1939, he's carted off by the Red Army back into Russia. He never again touches Polish soil. So this is a man who lived to be 90, almost 97. This is when he's in his 40s, and he never goes back to Poland. So he is a Pole, he's an aristocrat, he's very proud and very self-conscious of being Polish, but he's not a Pole who could live in Poland, because after the Second World War, Stalin the blessing of Roosevelt and Churchill became the power that uh, the power of Poland became um, uh, a Soviet state, a satellite. So then he lived in Paris after the war. He stayed in Paris and he died there in 1993. Having been born in 1896, he lived almost the whole 20th century. End of question. <laughs> End of answer. Thank you. That was beautifully done. And while he was in the, um, well, let's just flesh out a few details. Um, please talk a little bit about the fate of the fellow officers, uh, Polish officers, and his survival, and a little bit about the lectures on Proust that he gave in the Soviet prison camp. Uh, Chapsky was uh, captured, as I said, in early September, in, uh, actually in late September 1939. Uh, and, and became, the, he was captured by the German army with whom he was engaged in battle, but the Germans turned the officers over to the Soviet Union and they kept the rank and file prisoners for themselves. So there, was, there were about um, 50,000 Polish officers at that time. 22,000 of them were in three separate camps in Soviet Russia, determined by the Red Army uh, that these would be camps just for these officers. Um, actually, not determined by the Red Army, but determined by the NKVD, which was the, uh, the forerunner of the KGB. So, in other words, they were not military prisoners, but they were political prisoners. And the reason that this is significant is because they, if they were not military prisoners, they didn't have to be dealt with as military men but rather as political prisoners. And in Soviet Russia, to be a political prisoner was a fate far worse. Um, so he, at one point, the soldiers were broken up over a period of months into different groups. And in, um, in, the, um, in 1940, Chapsky and a group of 395 other Polish officers from different camps were in one camp together in um, a place called Gryazjewicz. And this was a camp 
which was a little bit better than the camp they had been in before. Uh, but they were able to give a series of lectures. This was something they were unable to do in their earlier camps, but the com commandant of this camp gave them permission to give lectures. And the reason for the lectures, which was requested by the prisoners, was that every night it would help their morale to talk about something. They were living in unbelievable conditions. There was lice in the beds. There was no nutrition in what passed for food. Uh, and it was a Siberian winter. I mean, we're talking about days, many days, where it was 45 and 50 de degrees below zero. And they would have to go out and work and then come back. So at night, they would gather. And each night, one of them, one of the 395 officers would decide they would talk about something that they loved, something they were passionate about. Mm -hmm. Uh, not political, because they knew well enough that even with 395 polls, if they started talking politics, it would end in badly. So they all spoke about other subjects. Chapsky originally spoke about the history of French painting, something that he knew a great deal about and was willing to share. Um, and he lectured on that subject and then began to think, I should talk about Proust. Chapsky had read Proust in those years in Paris, just as the volumes were coming out one after another in the 1920s. Chapsky knew many of the people who Proust molded into characters. So he had a great uh, affinity for Proust. Proust was very important to him. And he understood that speaking about Proust in these conditions would be enormously uh, restorative and, and helpful to the men to understand the idea of time and how to use their time. So Chapsky's book is, uh, Proust's novel is called In Search of Lost Time. And those two words, lost time, temps perdu, have so much resonance in a prison mm -hmm. where you are without uh, the ability to live your life. He gave these talks to the men in the camp, two of his fellow officers, afterwards had him repeat some of the talk and they transcribed it. That's the text that we have, is, is these lectures that were transcribed afterwards. Um, so shortly after this happened, we understand, what happened essentially was that Germany invaded Soviet Russia so that Hitler attacked his ally Stalin. And all of a sudden, the nature of the war changed for these men. They went from being enemies of the state to being comrades in arms because the Soviets needed as many men as they could get. So they decided to allow the Polish uh, officers to form an army in the, within the Red Army. This happened, and as that began to happen, there was this idea, we have to find the other 22,000 officers to help us lead this kind of an army to fight Hitler. So Chapsky was the one who was um, most concerned about where these men were. And his commanding officer, new commanding officer named General Anders, appointed him to go and find these other men, to go to Moscow, to talk to the Russian leaders, to find out what camps these men were in so that they could bring them all together. Um, what had happened, this was 1941 in June when the Hitler attacked uh, uh, Russia, but in the previous spring of 1940, just months after Chapsky had become a prisoner, Stalin had ordered the execution of these 22,000 men. They were buried in frozen ground already by now, at this point when Chapsky goes to look for them, he, they had already been dead for a year. Nobody knew this, and the Soviet army was very happy not to say anything about it because nobody knew they were dead and buried. They were out of the picture. Mm -hmm. But in 1943, as Chapsky is ending his search for these men, the Germans, the Nazis, reclaim the Soviet territory and discover the mass graves. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes a huge issue um, because in the international community, the Germans are accusing the Soviets of mass murder. The Soviets, on their part, claim that the Nazis did it. And that line, that official line of the Soviet state, that it was the Nazis who killed these men, 
remained the line until 1990 when the Soviet Union ended. So officially you could not talk about, these men are known, the men that were killed were known as the um, victims of the, the massacre in the Katyn forest. Katyn is the place name that was where the first graves were dug up. The men were killed in several places, but Katyn became the umbrella name for all of the 22,000 men that were killed. Um, Thank you. So, in reflecting on this work, and we're going to come into the work more deeply, uh, but uh, when we were talking, you first heard about Chopsky in 2012, is that correct? Yes. When a friend of yours in Paris sent you uh, his lectures on Proust. Yes. And you began to read them and thought you could translate them. Uh, but they also began to have a powerful effect on you. So I understand the power of the effect. What I'm curious about is the strategic decision you made to devote uh, seven years of your life to an unknown Polish, or not, I mean, known in some circles, but basically in the West, unknown uh, Polish uh, painter, writer, uh, hero of Poland, and so on. It's easy for me to understand why you chose to do paintings in Proust, because Proust is a, a global figure, and, and what you did with paintings in Proust, where you researched all the paintings that Proust refers to in his work, and you created a, a sort of a subfield of Proust studies that hadn't existed before in that form. Uh, but you're very conscious about what you choose to do. So I'm just curious, as you found yourself beginning to be inspired by Chopsky, what was the internal process by which that sense of being inspired by this virtually unknown person was in any kind of play with your question about your... Uh, trajectory as a painter and uh, writer, and that resulted in, in really such an important part of an important period of your life being devoted to this unknown Polish painter. Well, when I began in 2012 to translate the lectures, um, I had no sense of what I was path I was, I was starting on. I mean, if I had known then that it would be seven years, I, I, I don't know. Um, my, for me personally, the hardest obstacle, the first obstacle I really came across, and the biggest one was whether I was qualified to write about Chapsky, primarily because of the language difficulty. Chapsky, as I said, was a cosmopolitan. He spoke French, German, Russian, um, Polish. He read in English and Italian. He spoke those languages if needed be. I just had English and French. And to write a book about a Polish personality like this, I felt I didn't really think I could do it because I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't willing to spend three years studying Polish at that point in my life and, and coming out with a kind of, you know, okay Polish, uh, and then write about him. So what I really convinced myself of, uh, with the help of some people who, who knew of my interest, was the fact that the language that Chapsky and I spoke in common was not English or French, but painting. And so uh, I related to him as a painter, and I began to look into his work and to see images and to have to decide whether or not I wanted to devote this much time to a painter whose work didn't immediately say to me, uh, I have to write about this. My, my opening interest in Chapsky was really who this man was as a man, not so much as a painter. Um, and then I, of course, over the course of time realized that this is exactly my own situation. Is I don't think of myself, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a painter, I'm a good painter, but, um, and that's, that's a very Chapsky-esque 
kind of situation that I'm committed to what I do, he was committed to what he did. Well, there was a lot of overlap in terms of both doubt about our endeavor and, and determination to, to stick to it and to see what comes of it. Um, so that, that was the, uh, the idea that uh, as I was translating it, I thought, who is this guy? You know, why don't I know all this information? Why don't I know that there were Polish soldiers in Soviet camps mm -hmm. in 1940 and that 22... I mean, I had heard of the Katyn massacre, but, you know, if you read the history of the Second World War, what's 22,000 men, honestly? You know, I had grown up in a very um, politically aware and very politically active family in New York that um, if... Asked, I would say, you know, if I was pushed, I would say I was Jewish, but there was no religious association. My father, in fact, said to me, if anybody ever asks you on a form to state your religion, just put New Yorker. <laughs> um, but, you know, I didn't really have a sense that um, I could necessarily relate to him on the le level of his deep Catholicism um, or um, his clearly, I mean, his clearly brilliant mind. Uh, he was somebody who, uh, who represented a, a level of learning that I, I was in great admiration of, but nobody else I knew knew him. And as I began to do this, the whole world opened up to me about Polish literature, which we know very little of because very little of it actually is translated into English. So. Um, I can give you a list of names of, you know, uh, Stempowski, uh, Herling, um, Jelensky, uh, I, I mean, Herbert, uh, Miłosz. There are all these poets and writers who, of the 20th century who are just at the top of the game of poetry. And we don't really know them. They also, most of them are also essayists and write brilliant commentary on poetry and, and the world. And I was able, fortunately, because I have French, to read much of this which was translated into French. That was my, my real uh, opening. Uh, but the Polish eluded me. And I will say this, Michael, you said that I wrote what you thought might be the definitive biography of Chapsky. This is certainly not the case because I don't have access to everything that Chapsky wrote and, and, um, and what he represented. And right now, since my book has come out, uh, one of the um, most prominent Polish biographers has begun to write the definitive biography uh -huh. of Chapsky, which will take him enormous amount of time. He wrote, a, he wrote an 1,800-page biography of Czesław Miłosz. He wrote a two-volume, almost 2,000-page biography of Herbert. And both of those guys are nothing compared to Chapsky in, ter in terms of archival ma material. Mm -hmm. Chapsky kept a diary. There are 298 volumes of his diaries, which have yet to be deciphered. I mean, there are parts of them that are, are known to us, but this man, Frenashik, will have to go through every page of the diaries. He will have to read everything Chapsky wrote. Um, and that was something that I did not do. And um, uh, I'm very happy that it is happening, that, that he will be... Uh, dealt with by, by a real biographer. My biography in Polish is called Biography of a Painter. Almost nothing, biography, the biography of a painter. And that's really what it, it is. And he will do a, a biography of the man's whole life. So, so interesting. You said that what convinced you that you could do this when you weren't certain that you could undertake it because you didn't have Polish as a language was that you had, uh, you had painting in common. And that was the language that you... But you then went on to say that his painting was not what drew you most. It was the man. At that point in time. At that point in time. Yes. And so when I look at... I mean, I, I find... You know, I, find, I found the lectures extraordinary. I found your biography extraordinary. And I find this extraordinary... Um, a book of his uh, paintings and drawings, which also has two major essays in it, along with a chronology and your own um, your own uh, views on Chopsky. But um, the way I think about it is, when trying to think about Chopsky, uh, 
there's the life, there's the work, both the art and the thought. There's the circle, his circle, the people he knew who he was one. There's the cultural context, there's the historical context, and then there's his character. And for me, I have to say that the most powerful aspect of him that emerges is his character. Uh, the qualities of courage, of extraordinary modesty, of acuity of observation, of integrity, and the choices he made in his life. And so um, I'm just curious, uh, when you say that at that point, it was more the man than the art, at this point, where are the deepest resonances for you with Shabsky? Well, I have to say that uh, the painting has reached a level of importance to me, which is perhaps as much about the life of a painter as about the paintings themselves. Chapsky painted many, many remarkable paintings, um, some even, I could say, great on the level of anything done in the 20th century. Um, but what is so important to me is his relationship to his painting, to being a painter, the story of being a painter, what that life is like. And um, the opportunity to do this monograph um, was very important to me because I was able to make a selection. There are many, the beginning of this process was actually like a detective story where I had to find the paintings in the first place. Mm -hmm. There was no obvious place to look for Chapsky paintings. And my initial resistance to the paintings was because I was seeing bad photographs online, backlit, you know, um, that gave me an indication that perhaps there was something here, but I really couldn't tell whether or not there was. Now, years later, um, I have a little Chapsky canvas here, which is one of the kind of painting that Chapsky would wake up in the morning and do a still life. You know, he did a painting a day kind of, that was his practice, was he would wake up and he would make a painting. Uh, if it lasted from the day before, he would continue to work on it. But many of his works are minor works that are about the discipline, the way that a pianist does scales. Chapsky would, would get up in the morning and make a painting. So, I mean, I think if you look carefully at this painting, which is what looking at painting is all about, is the care you take in looking at it, which means not seeing it just in a monograph or, in an ex, you know, or in, online, but to going to actually see the work itself. I mean, there is detail. The hand of the painter is in every painting. And I find that Chapsky's hand is a supremely interesting hand as a painter to me. And the older Chapsky got, this was painted in 1982 by an 86-year-old man. So there's something about the way in which he trusts the brush to relay what he sees. Mm -hmm. And because he was beginning at this time in his life to lose his eyesight, he trusted his brush to see for him even. Mm -hmm. So that he had to make the choice of what color to put down but somehow it was in the process of building the painting that he learned what he was seeing. And this to me is a very remarkable activity that is not explained enough or written enough or, or felt enough. And so that this is where I feel I have something to say as a fellow painter. Um, Chapsky at this point in 1982 in his room, he lived in the same room in Paris for almost 50 years, um, which was his bedroom, his studio, his library, a very small room, about a third the size of this room we're in now. Um, and he would, at this point in his life, he had large manila envelopes on his work table. And on the, on the front of the envelope, it would say yellow or blue because he couldn't see well enough the small print on the tube of paint to know what it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he would lay out his palette from these envelopes. And just to come up with that, this, uh, as a kind of tossed off morning painting, I mean, there were about four or five in this series that he did over a couple of mornings that I've seen. This is one that I own, but uh, the same arrangement of the, uh, of the cup and, and the pieces of fruit and the drape. I mean, it's, it's nothing. And this is also what my book is called, is called Almost Nothing, uh, 
But as he said, in that nothing is everything. And so even in a little study like this, if you come up and look at it, looking in the layering of it, this is what I tried to do in the monograph as much as possible, was to show details of the work so that you're not just, oh, it's a still life and you go on to the next one. But if you look, come and look in the corners here, there is so much mystery and so much layering of, of space and, and thoughtfulness and, and where his hand uh, holds off and where his hand goes in. It's, it's a little, it's kind of like a little miracle. And so his life was full of morning miracles. Uh, sometimes, sometimes he made a great painting. This, for instance, is, a, um, a, I think, 1965, one of his great paintings. It's, it's, uh, it's about 30 by 40 inches. It is, um, it is just so complicated in its simplicity and simple in its complexity. It's uh, the composition of the stairwell going around, the fact that the woman is seen but her head is not seen. Um, it is, it, it's clearly something he came across. He drew it in his sketchbook that he was always with. He made a drawing of, of this, and then he brought it back to the studio and he made a painting of it. And this was one of the most successful transitions from his sketchbook to his can to the canvas and this is at a point 1965 in his career when he's finally i had talked about being in the 20s in paris when he wasn't sure of his voice he didn't have the confidence he was finally at the point where he was learning what cezanne says about drawing with paint so that you're not drawing and then painting his early paintings all look like drawings that have been filled in and they're not terribly successful all the time but he finally had, at six, so he's 69 when he's doing this. Uh, and this is hugely moving as a 65-year-old painter for me to think about how much you can get better, but you just stick at it. Something will come out of it. Um, so this is, uh, you, you get this between the small and, and the, the bigger resolution of, of his vision. There are so many pieces that stuck out for me in, in your uh, monograph. Um, and I'll just pull a few together and ask you to respond. One was uh, that he, he was a figurative painter in a period where all the forces were going toward abstract art around him. And, and he chose that and stayed with it. But just, um, the second, um, you mentioned Cezanne, who... Um, uh, uh, one of your essayists, I believe, says was Chopsky's model, and I'd love to hear more about that. You spoke of his um, a painting in old age, and there was a beautiful line, I think, in one of your essayist book, uh, comments, but it might be yours, that Chopsky refused old age. I loved that. You know, in other words, he continued to be deeply vital. Um, and... Um, but the, the thing that really struck me was that here was this uh, religious man, Catholic, um, who had this enormous psychic encounter with the work of Simon Weil. And Simon Weil, for those who don't remember or don't know, was this uh, uh, Jewish uh, woman who... Um, was a philosopher, an extraordinary philosopher, who uh, and was very agnostic. And then she had an encounter, uh, an inner encounter with Christ. And it just totally struck her. And she developed a dialogue with a Catholic uh, figure, bishop, whatever. Um, but she never actually became Catholic because she felt that Catholicism excluded those who had not converted. So she wanted to be with those who had not converted. She went to England during the war and ultimately died trying to live on the rations that you were supposed to live on. Well, uh, she gave away her rations. Yeah, she gave away her. In any case, she was this extraordinary figure. I, I used to study her um, the work. But what fascinated me was that Chopsky was deeply engaged with her. He filled uh, pages, if not volumes, of his diaries. And the way I understood it from your book, um, 
he felt that her position was that he actually shouldn't be painting as a religious person because imagination was filling up the space in which God could actually speak to you, which is actually a very beautiful and interesting concept. This goes back into the Sufi tradition big time where the imaginal realm is where the divine comes down and the human come up into that realm. So here you have this man, this extraordinarily literate, uh, engaged man, deeply religious Catholic, but overwhelmingly engaged. He goes to a theater piece about Simone Weil's uh, work and life. The actress uh, looks an awful lot like Simone Weil. And he's literally shaking with, uh, uh, with responsiveness. So um, I threw out a number of things there, but let's, let's address this question of the role of Simon Weil in Chopsky's uh, inner life. Okay. Uh, and then we'll go back to yeah. um, abstraction. Yeah. Um, well... Chapsky was a very non-conventional Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, his mother was an extremely conventional Catholic. Mm -hmm. As I said, he grew up on this estate in Belarus, in Belarus um, and his mother insisted that all of the servants be Catholic. Now, in Belarus, there aren't many Catholics. <laughs> Um, you know, most of the people were Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox. Uh, and so she had a very intense relationship to what was correct. She died when Chapsky was only six. Um, and one of the ways in which he and his siblings, he had uh, five sisters and a brother, uh, one of the ways in which they honored her was, I think, in part to, to maintain their faith their Catholicism. But Chapsky always knew that he, if he didn't do the right thing with his mother, she would somehow make it about his Catholic, about his not being a good Catholic. So, um, but as he grew, he, he maintained his, his faith, but he didn't, he wasn't somebody who went to, to services, to church. Um, he didn't take com confession, he didn't take communion. Um, but he was a very devout man who thought a great deal about his relationship with God. Um, so Simone Weil died in 1944, I believe, um, while the war was still on. She starved herself to death, um, and her work started to come out after that. She had been known, but not very well. She was a young woman. I mean, she died, I think she was in her 30s. Um, she... Um, her work began to be published in French after the war, you know, 45, 46, 47, and began to accumulate into a body of work that was very important. Chapsky from the beginning was attracted to this work and struggled with it because um, she was an absolutist. Simone Weil, as you know, as they often say, um, you know, Jews make the best Catholics. You know, it's the, the, the idea of conversion uh, and, and the importance of it. Um, she was, uh, she was um, a very determined um, religious believer with exacting moral standards who was also highly politicized. So she went in her young life to work, even though she had graduated from the École Supérieure Normale in Paris, the best school for thinking in Paris. She was number one in her class. Number two was Simone de Beauvoir, and number three was Jean-Paul Sartre. So she had the chops. You know, she knew her stuff, but she chose, instead of trading in on that when she graduated, she went to work in a Renault car factory. She wanted to identify with the workers mm -hmm. because she, for her, felt that Christ was talking about people, you know, not about bishops and not about uh, services. And Anyway, Chapsky was very drawn to this. 
And um, he struggled with it because Simone Weil claimed, as you kind of encapsulated this idea, that um, that attention it was her word, attention, um, was what was necessary to live, and that in order to be attentive, to have attention, you you have to be empty, and that you can't fill yourself with distraction. You have to be present when the divine comes into your life. Mm -hmm. And for Chapsky, this was perfectly comprehensible. But what it meant from Simone Weil's point of view was that you can't fill that space with the imagination. You can't fill that space with a creative life. You can't fill that space with, with a love life. You can't fill it with any number of things. You have to, in your life, to, to be connected to God, you have to be empty, essentially. You have to be a vessel to receive the light. Um, and he, uh, he appreciated the idea, this idea that attention, and he said, as Simone Weil said, attention is prayer. That's how you pray, is that you empty yourself, which is also not unlike meditation. Whatever it is, it, it makes sense to us now. It was, um, but she was absolute about it. And so Chapsky grappled. In his diaries, he would read her work and he would write responses to it. And he would talk about her to people. And, and he raised her profile, certainly in the Eastern European community, most likely, most powerfully, by passing the work of Simone Weil onto Czesław Miłosz. And Miłosz translated Simone Weil into Polish. And that was one of the enormous ways in which Czapski impacted uh, Polish life, even though he never went back to Poland. You know, one of the things that strikes me, and I think it strikes you, but I'll be curious to hear what you say, that draws me to this kind of work um, is the immensity of the richness of Central European intellectual life. And I often feel that we in the United States, we don't have a fraction of it. We don't have a fraction of it. Well, what we have all turns and bows to this. Is what? They all turn and bow to this. Right, that's true. You know, they all, I mean, yeah. Susan Sontag, for instance, yeah. Philip Roth, right. all of these people who have tried in their careers to bring Eastern European literature and, and thought into American life. Right. Unsuccessfully, people really aren't interested in buying right. books by people whose names they can't pronounce. Um, so um, it is a remarkable, and I think I'd like to segue with that, into the two writers whose essays appear please, please. Uh, in the monograph. Excuse me. Who are living examples of this, this tr remarkable tradition. One of them is a man named uh, Adam Zagajewski, who is uh, a poet um, who is probably the most well-known Polish poet after Czesław Miłosz, uh, he taught in, uh, he came to America. Now all of this, um, so Zagajewski was born in 1945. So just as the war is coming to an end, he's born in Poland. The other man who wrote an essay that's in my book is a man named Wojtek Karpinski. Karpinski was born in 1943 in Poland. These two men grew up, had their childhood at the beginning of the Soviet stranglehold on Poland. So, time. And the, the Soviets, of course, wanted to annihilate the intellectual class because it would meant resistance to the Soviet control, which is exactly, I didn't say this before, but this is why the 22,000 Polish officers were murdered by Stalin's order, because they would represent resistance to the Soviet way of life. And just one thing you didn't quite uh, clarify, what percent Polish officers other than Karpinski? No, no, Karpinski. You mean Chapsky? I mean Chapsky. Um, well, of the 22,000 officers yeah. that were, were in camps, yeah. there were only 395 men who were uh, left. Yeah, so Ch Chapsky was one of was 300. Was one of 395 of 22, men yeah. out of 22,000 yeah, men exactly. who, were, who, yeah. who were murdered. Yeah. So please go on. Yeah. Um, so 
Where was I? Um, you were talking about the, the two, the two of them. All right, both. the two men. And, okay, and so how, Karpinski you know. was born in forty-three, and Zagievsky was born in forty-five. So they grew up under extremely strained circumstances. They managed to have uh, the Soviets, of course, made the teaching of Polish illegal. Everything had their, you know, their education had to be in, in Russian. So it was a whole transition from one culture to another, a culture that had been suppressed. Mm -hmm. In the 18th and 19th and early 20th century by the Prussian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Tsarists, now we're being repressed by the Soviets. So these two men found their ways to make, I mean, to make a living. I think, you know, uh, when they became young men and determined on their paths to become writers and intellectuals, uh, they had to cover their tracks. They had to somehow have a life that would not... Um, make them prone to being censored by, by the, the powers that be. Uh, so they took jobs, they did what they could, but they also both got out of Poland at a certain point um, and were able to study on grants from the state abroad uh, to study art and to study history. And their writing begins in the freedom of coming to Europe for the first time. And then later on, by, by 19... Uh, by 19, in the 60s, Wojtek Karpinski gets to Paris um, and he goes to visit the home of the Polish intellectual journal called Kultura, which Chapsky had been one of the three founding members of. This is a magazine that started publishing in 1947 from Paris after the war and represented the non-communist voice of Poland. The intellectual class that was being suppressed in Poland was given enormous free reign in Paris in this magazine called Kultura. Um, so Karpinski in 1965 goes to Paris and um, actually meets Chapsky. It's, he's introduced at a lunch party and the two of them begin this conversation. So Karpinski at that point is in his 30s and Chapsky is at that point in his 70s. And the age difference doesn't really matter. They meet at lunch, they talk through lunch, all of a sudden it's dark, Chapsky goes home, Karpinski goes back to him, his room. And um, the next morning, Karpinski writes in his book about Chapsky, he says, there was a note under my door. So that Chapsky had gone home and continued the conversation <laughs> in, a, in a letter. Um, so... In 1980, Karpinski comes to America um, and he is teaching at Yale. Uh, and then he teaches at NYU. He's invited by Tony J Judd to teach at, uh, at NYU. In uh, 1981, martial law is declared in Poland. And so Karpinski's name is on a list of people to be detained. They don't know that, they haven't quite yet figured out that he's not in the country, but he's on the list. From Poland, he finds out he's on the list and he knows he can't come back to Poland. So he, uh, he actually goes to Paris and that's where he lived from that point on and continues to live. Adam Zagajewski became a very, very well-regarded uh, poet uh, and published all over the world. He came to, came to America. He taught at the University of Houston uh, for years, and then he went to the University of Chicago and was part of the department, uh, the uh, history of social consciousness. Uh, an amazing poet, an amazing uh, intellect. Uh, both of them are, are the most delightful men in the world to be with and to be around. They're awe-inspiring. And um, I thought, you know, I needed essentially the blessing of both of them to do this book. You dedicate the book to Karpinski. This monograph, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I write about in my biography, the first Chapsky painting that I ever saw was in his apartment in Paris. Mm -hmm. And that was when it happened, that I knew after having looked at photographs and online images of Chapsky's work, and I wasn't so sure. When I saw that painting in his apartment, I knew there was something there for me to, to write about, seriously. Um, so when you, when you talk about, the last time we talked, I think, that when you looked at the painting in, um, in Karpinski's apartment in Paris, that you have a way of looking at paintings, uh, that you start by standing back from it, 
then you come close out, and then you come to a middle ground. And that struck me when I was looking at the monograph because the, the way you present the paintings at the beginning is very non-obvious. Uh, so the very first... Um, oh, oh, yeah, uh, you can hold it. Maybe you can hold it. The very first things are very close-up pieces. These are details of paintings. Yeah, of paintings. Uh, and then, so there's this... And I just thought, did your editors give you a hard time about this, or was that uh, something that they were automatically up for? Well... Um, Look at that, yeah. So these are the hands of the poet Zbigniew Herbert in a, from a portrait, a bigger portrait of the whole man. Speaking of this image, there's a marvelous line somewhere in the book where uh, Picasso is being told by a professor of art in Paris, I think, that his work has very much influenced his students. And Picasso responds, idiots, they should be studying the toes of the model. And so that image there of the hands <laughs> reminded me of that. And that also reminds me that what you said before, you quoted perhaps me as saying that Chapsky refused old age. Yeah. That was actually Zagajewski's quote oh, okay. from the essay in yeah. the book. Yeah. Uh, Zagajewski wrote a beautiful essay called Toil and Flame, which I got the rights to reproduce in this book. Mm -hmm. um, Zagajewski met Chapsky uh, when he was in his 30s and Chapsky was in his 80s. Uh, and he would go and read to Chapsky, who was losing his sight. Uh, so the, the essay is, is a beautiful tribute to, to Chapsky. So talk a little about Chapsky's circle, which, as I said, you can look at the life, you can look at the work, you can look at the character. Uh, there are all these different things you can look at. But um, Chapsky, with this profound innate modesty uh, and this profound integrity was very tall. Six and a half feet. So, yeah, very tall, slender, erect, six six. bearing, remarkable figure. But it, it, someone says in the book that he's not somebody that you would necessarily pick out at a dinner party or something uh, except for his height. Uh, but it, it, it wasn't as if he he stood out or sought to stand out. No, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. So there was this enormous modesty, integrity, and yet one-to-one, -one, he had an immense power in his engagements. So talk a little about his circle. Well, I can talk about his circle, um, but the, the reality for me is that he was a circle of one. Right. Um, That's and, a very important point. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think this was a man who lived in one room, as I said, for 50 years, mm -hmm. took care of what he needed, uh, and was, he was an extremely extroverted introvert in the sense that he needed to have non-studio time with people he could engage with. But his, uh, his real soul, his, re his real being was by himself in his room, in constant, I can, I can change this then, I can say a circle of two, because he spoke to his diary, and his diary spoke back to him. So that he was not silent all this time that he was by himself. He was writing to him. He was writing his thoughts. And then every morning, before he got up to paint the painting, he would reach up from his bed. There was a bookshelf right underneath it, and he would randomly pull out one of the volumes of his diary, which was on the shelf, and he would open it up and he would start speaking with himself, his old self, somebody who had written either, you know, last week or it had been 30 years ago, and he would, he would annotate, he would write back to him, so he would scribble on these pages, you know, oh, you know, he would say, oh, what was I thinking? Or, you know, <laughs> you know or underline some. I hit the underlining in his diaries is amazing. He goes back, every time he remembers something, he underlines it, and then, you know, six years later, he'll come back and he'll read it again and underline it again. Anyway, so he was a circle. He was a very tight circle. Beyond that, once he left the realm of his room, which Zagajewski describes beautifully in this essay. Actually, can I read? Can I please, read? please. This is just to give you a sense of um, the room was divided into one part was the studio. And yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, let me see if I can find it easily. So this is in, uh, Zagayevsky here is, is in his room describing Chatsky. The sofa was his reservation, his dominion, his desk, his library, his bedroom, his studio, his parlor. Chatsky's father had owned an enormous estate near Minsk, a palace in Przuki. Servants, carriages, trees, forests, fields, vegetables, and roses, while Yusuf only had a sofa. He slept on it at night, while during the day, propped against a pillow that was propped against a worn spot on the wall, bent like a penknife with his Gothic knees aloft. He would take notes in his journal, write letters, sketch, receive visitors, all on the sofa. Above the sofa, shelves held books and albums of reproductions. Books, sometimes still wrapped in their packing paper to protect them from time, remained in their assigned spots for so many years that Yosef would reach for them without looking, completely automatically. His long arms, like, harbor, like a harbor crane, would wander on high. His fingers would tap the book's spines and infallibly, for some, or sometimes fallibly, extract an exhibit catalog of Morandi's paintings, a slim volume of Hoffmannsthal's poems, a collection of Miwosh essays, Simone Weil's letters, Stanis Brozowski's diary. If, however, the book he sought was located on the top shelf, just below the ceiling, Yosef would stand on the sofa, even taller, tall and wobbling on the mattress's soft foundation. And then I, and probably every other visitor who witnessed this, feared that this 90-year-old gymnast would collapse. <laughs> but he was on his estate. Nothing could harm him on the sofa that had replaced the palace in Kruzuki. He was safe in his soft castle. There was nothing insulting about this diminution, and he didn't feel impoverished, not in the least. The sofa truly became a palace. His towers were Mirandi's bottles. One of Herbert's poems formed the roof. His stairways were composed of Malraux's bloated tomes on art, and the garden was replaced by two windows, beyond which swayed the boughs of French chestnut trees. Mm -hmm. so. But do speak for a moment of just at least some of the figures with whom he interacted in French culture. Um, he, in the 20s, he became very close to a man named Daniel Alevi. Daniel Alevi was the brother of um, Elie Alevi, and they were the sons of Ludovic Alevi and the nephews of um, Fromentin Alevi, the last of who wrote the libretto for Carmen, the opera. And um, they were an enormously cultured family, uh, Chapsky met them. They actually, they, the, they had been Jewish, but converted. Um, uh, Chapsky became very close to Daniel Alevi, who was 30 years his senior. So just as I had said that Zagayevsky and Karpinski were so much junior, so Chapsky as a young man befriended these, this older man. The, 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 the amazing thing about Daniel Alevi was that when he was 16, he was in the same class as Proust in high school. And Proust had an enormous crush on him and wrote him obscene love letters. So this is another connection to, to, to Proust for Chapsky through Alevi. Alevi introduced him to André Malraux. He introduced him to all sorts of writers and thinkers. Wasn't there a connection with Simone de Beauvoir? I forget what it was. No. Oh, I Simone de Beauvoir, were... no. Um, uh -huh. Sartre, of course, was the person who tried to destroy Proust. Uh -huh. Sartre and Beauvoir were the ones who said, this is, you know, bourgeois posturing. I didn't remember that at all. Yeah, yeah. and so Chapsky was never uh -huh. uh, drawn to, to, to that circle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also because the fact that that circle took its calling from Moscow. Yeah. This was the French communist circle that would not tolerate the right. idea of a free Polish voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was very complex. Mm -hmm. um, he knew this woman named Misia Sert, who was also Polish born. She was the doyenne of Paris in the 20s and 30s, 40s. Her best friend was Coco Chanel. Her confidant was Diaghilev. She wore everything that she wore, everybody else wanted to wear. She was enormously chic. Uh, she had incredible style. She had incredible money to spend because she married wealthy men. Um, but she had a salon that 
everybody went to. She was painted by Renoir, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, Picasso, Bonnard, Vuillard. All of these people came, sat at her feet, and painted portraits of her. She was a zaftic woman who was also uh, a great pianist who had studied <coughs> with, uh, with um, Faure. Her grandfather was a close friend of Liszt. I mean, so there's this kind of pedigree. So she, Chapsky, because they were both Polish, they had an immediate rapport. Chapsky was living on nothing in the 20s. I mean, he had no money. And he, uh, he was living for a time with uh, Sergei Nabokov, who was the brother of Vladimir Nabokov, the gay brother who died in the prison camps of the uh, Second World War. Chapsky and he had been lovers for a short period of time. Um, so that was the, the circle from the 20s that continued. And then after the war, um, he just was available and present. He, he knew de Gaulle. Uh, Chapsky was one of three people on de Gaulle's list of, um, of, from the Polish world who could at any time, 24 hours a day, interrupt him and, and, and speak with him. Uh, he knew many painters, um, but mostly the art world connection was, and this brings us back to the earlier question about abstraction. Um, Chapsky in the 50s was struggling to come back to life after a decade of being a prisoner of war and then working for the Polish cause. And he started uh, to paint in the style that he had always hoped to paint, and that was an observation of the natural world around him in daily life, uh, in, in both in its aspects in nature and in uh, kind of social society. Uh, this was at a time when abstract expression was really beginning to dominate the world stage. Uh, in fact, to paint in the way that Chapsky painted was considered uh, to be completely outmoded um, and not taken seriously. This, in the 50s, reflects back on the 20s when Chapsky was a student in Poland in a, at the Art Academy, mm -hmm. when Polish artists were divided almost down the middle between Russia's, Russian constructivism and futurism and all of that conceptual art that later developed and this narrow, historical, religious type of painting. So Chapsky was in not, comfortable in neither camp. But the idea of abstraction um, of Kandinsky and, um, and Mara uh, um, sorry, um, Montreal, I mean, all of these painters who were painting abstractly very early on never fed him. And so later, fast forward to the 50s and 60s, when that's all that you could see in the galleries in Paris, where Pierre Soulage and, I mean, painters who were clearly second rate compared to the, what was happening in New York because all of the European painters had come to New York, uh, you know, Rothko and Klein and de Kooning, these were all Europeans who created a New York school but who had fled the old Europe, the shackles of Europe, for the freedom of New York. You have a beautiful passage uh, describing uh, Chopsky's uh, life in the 30s. He's in Paris, but he goes to Madrid and sees Goya's work. And you say it's a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's another major step in his aesthetic education. Yes. Could you speak to that? Sure. Um, in 1930, when at the end of the, the seven years that the Polish group was spending in Paris uh, working together, Chapsky went to Spain, um, and he discovered really the work of, pa uh, of, of Goya um, on two levels. One, and if you've been to the Prado, you know what this is about. On the main floor of the Prado, you see all of Goya's portraits of the royal family. You see, you know, incredible, uh, revealing portraits about each of them as an individual uh, in their eccentricity and nuttiness and, you know, kind of almost that inbred quality that the aristocracy often have. Um, and, but they're spectacular portraits. And then you go downstairs and the paintings, which are known as the black paintings of Goya, are displayed there. They were taken from the walls of his house. And these are paintings which come from a very different place. And this was a revelation to Chapsky that somebody, a single painter, could embody both of these two worlds. And that helped him to understand how he could possibly develop as a painter because he was so 
sure that by following one path, he was neglecting another, which had equal importance for him. It reminds me of your reading of uh, Walt Whitman, the community reading, and reading recently about Whitman and how, um, how uh, he lived at some level in consideration of the moral strictures of his time, but that imaginatively he was able to be completely free. And what he did in the bedroom and what he did with his imagination were the areas where that freedom took place. So that uh, just the comment on... Well, like Chapsky, uh, Whitman, like Chapsky, I would say, there was a lot less happening in the bedroom than anybody really thinks right Right, now. Right, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think uh, a great deal has been made about their sexuality, which I think would would somehow um, depress both of them. Well, Chopsky, I don't remember. Maybe you speak to. I'm sure you speak to it in the in the biography, but uh, it doesn't. It certainly wasn't a highlight of his public life the way it was with Whitman, right? Well, it wasn't with Whitman either. But I mean, that's. I mean, in, you're turning, talk, talking about freedom of of sexual choice. Or? Well, freedom of sexual expression in Whitman was yeah. certainly. No, also not major. publicly. All right. I think, I think okay. that was more a, a, a private. Um, I mean, Whitman in the in Washington D.C. with the soldiers, yeah. you know, um, caressing them, and yeah. I mean, I don't see that as, as sexual. Okay, but I mean, he was free enough to feel that that if somebody needed to be held, yeah. that he had no compunction about holding yeah. them. There was a beautiful passage you, uh, in uh, the '80s. Um, where you or one of your essayists quotes Edward Said on the concept of late style in painters. Could you talk about that? Really? Yeah, he doesn't. Said wrote, wrote a book called On Late Style, mm-hmm. which is not about painters, right. particularly. It's more about music. Uh, he writes about Beethoven uh, extensively. Um, but essentially, he says, do you have the quote there? I don't. Okay. Um, essentially, what Said says is that... Um, Late in age, uh, there's a certain freedom that comes from not substituting reality for art. Mm. That somehow art becomes critical. And Chopsky, I I remember one time, uh, at one point, Chopsky goes to Giverny to see the reconstituted gardens of Monet. So this is already in the 70s or the 80s. And he's so struck by how uninteresting the gardens are compared to the paintings. And so this is the, and you know, Monet was, was going blind and couldn't see, and, and everything went into the art. And that was, a, uh, that's what made me think of uh, Said and, and this, this comment about late style, that somehow uh, if you're fortunate enough to, to um, ignore reality and just focus on your art, something happens at that point in life where your priorities are completely clear. Mm. Either you or one of your essayists describes Cezanne as Chopsky's model. Could you, as you know, I don't know a lot about art, what, what did uh, Chopsky see in Cezanne that was so important to him? Um, Chopsky was trying to negotiate the world that he saw to paint. Position. Point in time, one tradition, one history. Looking at what is in your view of putting it down. So essentially, God created that, or whoever that world exists, and this is your opportunity to have a response to that. And he, um, he painted very methodically and very carefully, and he saw the world here, and he saw it on the canvas here. Mm. And there was a, a somehow um, a construction of the world anew that was unusual. And this structuring of the world, breaking it down, it was considered obscene by his contemporaries. You know, when there was a Cezanne exhibit in Paris on a street, 
they would not let children walk down the street, you know, because they felt it was too corrupting. This idea of a nude by Cezanne that somehow was ugly, and that, the, that, that Cezanne saw what he saw and painted it that way. Uh, but what Chapsky found in him, as, as many painters do, myself including, it included, is the idea that um, a painting can be built brush stroke by stroke, and that somehow every stroke has to have significance. And that Chapsky was not able to meet that level, but nobody else has been either. I mean, Cezanne is, is unique in his devotion to the, the building of a painting. And when you look at a Cezanne painting, you know, nine times out of ten, you will see patches of canvas that are, you can see the canvas through. And that's because he hadn't yet determined what belonged there. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't put something down because he knew if he put the wrong thing down, the picture would collapse mm -hmm. and would not live up. And he destroyed many of his paintings and he hated a lot of his paintings and he just, um, and so many things that we now value so highly, he felt were, um, were failures. I mean, Cezanne is not somebody like Chapsky who, who embraced an image of himself as a successful painter. Well, Chomsky, toward the end of his life, said he felt he wasn't a, a failed artist, but an unfulfilled artist. I don't have to interpret that. I mean, yeah. you can all understand it, but it's very indicative yeah. of who he was. And also, you know, when he was 90, he was painting. He could barely see. Yeah. And you know, in his late 80s, he would say, I'm still alive. You know, that's the miracle that I'm making. And the paintings were reduced. I can show, this is the kind of um, very, they became, paradoxically, they became enormously abstract. But they were abstract in the sense that they were uh, experienced through suffusion of observation. This is still clearly a landscape painting but it's also an enormously what we would call an abstract painting. Could you show the, the very last uh, uh, drawing in the book? Yeah. I was so sorry. this is um, Chapsky as an old man who, his blindness had been such that he could no longer see the brushes, so he could no longer paint. So he continued to draw in his diaries, and then he could no longer see what he was drawing. And so what he wanted at the very end of his life was to just to have the the tactile contact. He could hold a pencil and he could find the book. And these are, you know, he was making marks. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That's so powerful. Yeah. You know, one, one other thing, and then we'll, we'll open it up for some comments, um, is um, I was thinking of, of the Goya, um, of the... Um, Uh, yeah, the Goya paintings in Madrid, the formal portraits and then the black paintings down below, and how Chopsky felt this was a model of reconciling these two different strands. Not necessarily reconciling, I would say uh, uh, including. Including. That right. it, was, it was not somehow a coming together, it right. was an acknowledgement of their right. separateness. And somewhere in the book, you or one of your essays says that... Um, Chopsky didn't really like to do formal portraits that he, if I remember correctly, that he did them, he was grateful for uh, the, the fees which enabled him to live and work. But what he really loved to do, and this is what the book mostly is, is to capture these scenes of everyday life. And so the book is, is filled with these wonderful scenes. Um, and... So one of the questions rose about what was it about specific scenes that, that Chopsky wanted to, um, to capture. Um, but the other um, facet of it was a debate among a number of different painters because the book is called uh, uh, the, the, the An Apprenticeship of Looking about how to look. Mm -hmm. And uh, one painter says, you just glance at the scene and that's enough. And others take a much longer look. But the quote at the very beginning is a quote about 
the longest apprenticeship in art is the apprenticeship of looking. So perhaps that's a nice place to finish our conversation before we open it up for comments. Good. Uh, what about uh, these different perspectives on the art of looking? Um, there's a story uh, that a Polish painter told me who knew Chapsky, who had come to Paris to visit him. And they were going together to an exhibition uh, in the center of the city. So they were waiting on the train, at the train station outside of Paris to get into town. And Chapsky all of a sudden turns around and sees a woman in a purple beret, a yellow shawl, a red skirt, and green boots. And he just essentially says, sorry, I got to go. And he, he has to capture this. So he leaves his friend to go to the museum by himself. And he goes home. And um, he makes two or three paintings of this woman. And when the friend comes back that night, he said, you know, he said, I didn't, you know, I couldn't get it. It wasn't there. You know, I should have come back early. You know, I should have. This is the idea that things triggered. Chapsky was never on the lookout for subject matter. Subjects came to him. Mm. So it would be something outrageous like this uh, heavy woman in, a, in, in this getup. Or, um, you know, a soldier kind of with a beer slumped over in a, in a cafe. Um, whatever it was, he had a life. He went out and around. He was a very um, social person. Uh, beyond the the, um, the confines of the studio, and that was what he went in search of was, you know, just to be available and to see what struck him. To to, and Zagajewski and I, uh, Adam Zagajewski, when we were in Warsaw together, in Krakow together, um, one day we're sitting in a cafe and we played this game essentially like. Who would Chapsky have drawn? Uh, you know, and you would see, and you would point there, and I would point there, and and you begin after looking at Chapsky's work over time, you you just begin to see what his eye saw, mm. and that um, that was really what his eye saw was what he wanted to bring to life on the canvas. Thoughts, reflections. Let's try to keep them brief so we can hear from more people. But uh, we have some very Thoughtful people here with us. Uh, Chris Dusser's come down from far the Berg of Point Reyes. Yeah. yeah. So Chris, you're a painter yourself, and uh, what are your reflections listening to this? Well, I've, I've been lucky to hear talk to, to read the books and, and to hear talk, and it's revelatory every time. Um, but this notion of looking and seeing as a and I as a painter. So that's my way of <coughs> expressing what I see. But I am so struck about how challenging it is to see without preconception. Because when I'm painting, I will get something wrong many times in a row, wrong in exactly the same way, even though I'm looking and I think I'm seeing. And it doesn't become my version of right anyway until I realize I didn't, I wasn't seeing. Mm -hmm. So, and this, you know, curious about responses to something like that. That's common. Well, no, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's a powerful reminder that, um, that we're all in the same boat when you're yeah. a painter. You know, as I said in, in my book somewhere, a painter is always only ever a student of painting. You don't master painting. I mean, there are great painters, and certainly they have, they have made great paintings, but we are all only ever in the service of something that's much bigger than, than we are. And that's what's exciting about it to me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jan. So, it, he did a lot of self-portraits, and you talk about that in your, in your introduction essay. Do you see any way that his perception of himself, or what he saw in himself, changed over time? Um, I think it was ever evolving, mm -hmm. yet almost always consistent, if those two mm -hmm. facets can be brought together. I mean, he, he, drew him, he drew himself endlessly because he was there. You know, he was a model. Um, and he was also looking at himself and figuring out who he was in the world. And yet, of all the people I've ever read or, or, or experienced through their work, 
I mean, he is so clearly who he is, so consistently. Um, he, is a, he is a man of many, many parts, and in each of those parts, he's one person. Um, as a writer, as a thinker, as a, um, as a public persona, as a painter, uh, he, his self-portraits are um, uh, a document of, of this idea of seeing. You know, and that who could he see better than himself? And at the same time, recognizing, as Chris said, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this, and oh my God, I'm not seeing it. So, you know, his drawings of, even of himself are explorations into discovery of self, um, which is a deepening process as opposed to, you know, um, something else. I think it is a cumulative process where he came to know himself more and more and better and better. But I think also he was somebody who knew himself extremely well. So um, it, it's certainly not vanity. Well, in all that you've been saying about... Kokchapsky. Kokchapsky. I've been very impressed that one thing is missing, which is any recognition of the wartime experience, which must have been a horrifying he came so close to being part of those 22,000 men who were buried in an unmarked grave. So I'm wondering where that went for him. Well, this is a very um, key point for the, the whole of the world at that point. Famously, um, Adorno, Theodor Adorno, the philosopher, said, is, there, is, there, is poetry possible after this? You know... <coughs> And that went for art and music. And um, there are ways in which the experience of the Second World War is so uh, destructive and um, nihilistic that to be creative in the light of that is a very difficult thing. And certainly, Chapsky, who drew his fellow prisoners in his sketchbooks, we have drawings of, uh, you know, that was one way of being there as evidence, as witness. Um, but to, to undertake a subject like that, one could say that it would take a Goya, you know, and Goya is fairly uh, singular in his place in the history of art in dealing with the Inquisition, with the, the dark, that dark underside. Um, there are certainly painters and, and poets and musicians who have, who have grappled with it. Um, uh, 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 a, a poet named Paul Salon, for instance, who wrote the poem that essentially convinced Adorno that poetry was possible after, you know, which is about, um, which is about the experience of the camps. Um, Chapsky, I think, wanted to be grateful for being alive. You know, he had no idea that his fellow officers had been killed until two years after they were dead. Um, and it was um, three years after even. Uh, it, was, it was a shock. And I think that he couldn't, to integrate that into, into his experience, was more complex than I think uh, he felt capable of. And also, not wanting to, to, to relive to, you know, to rehash that. Marty. Um, if, if this is either too naive or too intrusive, feel free to deflect it yourself, come back to it at some point. But um, you were in your late 50s when you got the book from Paris with the, um, the lectures in the camps. And you'd been putting your own work on paper for probably a half a century. And now you've spent seven years eight years counting conversations now, immersed with this guy, and you're going back to your own studio. What, if anything, can you say about what you'll take into your own work mm -hmm. when you become a painter again, primarily, rather than a mm -hmm. Chatsky follower? Um, it's a question I ask myself <laughs> a lot. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, I'll have an answer. But um, I think it's the way in which I admire Chapsky's ability to, to create a life around painting mm -hmm. that I will take back with. I mean, part of my interest in 2004, 
which was my 50th birthday, was when I decided to do the Paintings in Proust book, because I had just reread Proust, and I thought, I really want to do this project. It means it will take me away from painting. And at that point, I was sufficiently unconvinced of my own painting mm -hmm. that I was happy to have some kind of um, alternative response to my creative impulses. And I continue to have a lack of conviction about what it is to be a painter in the world today in terms of adding more to this horrible mountain of stuff that gets mm -hmm. passed under the name of art. Um, so I think Chapsky represents a purity of, of vision, of determination, that uh, helps feed my conviction that, that I should do just, I should just do it, not for anything else, but just to do it. And so I don't know what will come of it, but um, we'll see. Michael Sell, as you listen to your partner here speak of this seven years of work, any reflections uh, on what you're hearing? Uh, many. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, uh, the act of, um, the creative act going into the studio. Um, is one tries to get into the flow of the work. It's painful at first because it's halting. When you're in the flow of the work, um, the world disappears. Time disappears. Healing isn't the word. It's that all suffering is gone because you are you are concentrating and your spirit is moving in and out. It's moving. Um, I think, uh, John, that question about uh, how did Chapsky, um, uh, how did he survive the war? But look at his art. His art was, he, was, he survived the war for 50 more years. And it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a deep feeding. It's a deep channeling. Um, and it's like a trance state. And um, Eric Hat has had it for uh, seven years through Chapsky. And um, it'll be very hard to, and halting to get back to that. Uh, when he will, uh, I, have, I have that experience every day of trying to get back to periods of, of a creative flow where Suffering disappears. Thank you. Other questions, reflections? Yes. Jennifer. Um, Eric is going to say a version of what I'm about to say before, but I'll say it again too, which is this incredible quality when you're reading your books about Chapsky that is so almost feels ennobling for oneself to read about this amazing man. Um, and the devotion that you found in Chapsky, Eric, you reveal him to us, which is a gift to us, mm -hmm. but, but along with that is also the gift of your own devotion to the subject writing about him. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a kind of extraordinarily profound depth of the gifts that we are all given in the process you've gone through for seven mm -hmm. years. Um, it's deeply healing as a reader and, and a blessing. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, Eric, thank you for friendship and walking so much of this journey of this part of our lives together. I'm deeply grateful. Thank you.